the co-director of the World Inequality Lab at the Paris School of Economics and an affiliate professor at Sciences Po, Lucas Chancel, is an economist who specializes in inequality and environmental policy. His work focuses on the measurement of economic inequality, its interactions with sustainable development, on the implementation of social and ecological policies, coverage of his research can be found in Science, Nature, The Guardian, The Financial Times, The New York Times, CNN, Le Monde, Der Spiegel, El País, uh, among many others. Uh, and Luca will be in conversation with Albena Asmanova, who is a tenured uh, associate professor of political and social theory at the University of Kent's Brussels Schools of International Studies. Oof, so a long title. Um, the author of uh, The Scandal of Reason, A Critical Theory of Political Judgment um, from 2012. Albena has served as political advisor for the United Nations, the Council of Europe and the European Parliament, among other institutions. Can we have a round of applause, please, for Albena and Luca? Thank you. Um, so as a kind of way into your book, uh, Albena, I'd like to read a kind of opening very brief paragraph which is to say that uh, your book is in many ways a daring and unapologetic un intervention in a post-2008 financial crisis leftism. Uh, your book has been described as offering a radical alternative to traditional anti-capitalist narratives which place inequality at the center of their critiques and since we have Luca here with us this evening to kind of paradoxically uh, defend the critique of inequality, I do think we should first assault it. <laughs> um, so please tell us, uh, although you concede in your book that inequality certainly is important uh, and is a problem, why is it not the problem, you know, capital P of our age? And why is precarity the problem? And how would you uh, define precarity? Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate you all coming here to discuss the troubles of the 99%. Um, but let me approach this issue in, in, a, in a different way. Uh, so when I was a student uh, in New York in the 1990s, I picked up uh, the unshakable habit of reading The New Yorker, or if I didn't have much time, at least to ponder the front cover. And the front covers of The New Yorkers really capture the, the, the spirit of the time, the zeitgeist. Mm. You know, probably better than some of the hefty readings I had to plow through as a doctoral student. So remember the 1990s, the most prosperous decade of the 20th century. Working life especially was great at the time in Europe and America. Low unemployment, um, steady, gro uh, steady growth, um, a sense of limitless opportunity and even even fun, um, you know, and, and some of the covers of the New Yorker that I dug out um, really capture that. You can see here. So our office life was supposed to be a merry-go-round. Um, digitalization allowed us to escape the office and still do our jobs by the sea. Um, we would, um, you know, create uh, all these smart contraptions in our garages and become millionaires. Um, even office romance was celebrated, not nowadays. So basically, uh, everybody had a jolly good time. So the optimism of the 90s was quite remarkable. And then strange things started to happen. Uh, populist movements started mobilizing at the end of the 20th century in the late 90s in conditions of peaceful prosperity. So much before the, the economic crisis, that's often forgotten. That's one puzzle. The other puzzle is that when uh, the economic crisis hit in 2008 and brought in all this talk about terminal crisis of capitalism, capitalism on his deathbed. Remember, uh, Sar President Sarkozy was photographed reading uh, Marx's Capital. So yet, you know, that crisis, deep as it was, did not provoke the, the radical left-wing uh, insurgency that progressive forces had hoped for. On the contrary, it, uh, the, the support for the far right continued to grow. So not left-wing, right-wing insurgency. 
Um, and most recently, the, the protracted pandemic. Just think about it. Our, our societies are so affluent. They're scientifically advanced, um, politically sophisticated. We can um, measure gravitational waves in the, the fabric of space-time, my, my son who studied physics tells me. Um, we can alter the human genome, and yet we have trouble coping with a virus that is neither very deadly nor completely unknown. So the book um, addresses or gives an answer to such puzzles. So I tell the story of um, a pervasive weakening of our societies over at least the last 20 years. The development of a pathological state uh, that I call massive precarity, which is a condition of economic, political, and psychological fragilization, weakening, instability. Now, the COVID pandemic was in fact prepared, preceded by, and prepared by what I can only describe as a pandemic of precarity. So the interesting thing is that this condition of precarity does not affect only um, those on, on uh, in insecure jobs and, and poorly paid jobs. You know, uh, the authors like uh, Guy Standing, who has spoken about uh, the precarious class. Now I say we have a precarious multitude because those who are suffering precarity are also you know, the well-educated, highly skilled, well-paid professionals. So precarity is creeping up to the uh, very top of the social um, hierarchy. Um, we, we hear these um, you know, almost fantastic stories about uh, young bankers at Goldman Sachs begging for, uh, for, to, to have their working week capped at 80 hours and, and lawyer, uh, um, lawyers uh, burnout. So this is, in my reading, this is what troubles the, the 99%. And they have the right to worry, indeed. So let me just address three of the consequences of precarity. Why, why do we need to recognize it as the greatest social evil of our time? Now, one of the consequences is that precarity makes people conservative, even reactionary. So they're afraid of change, even when change is badly needed. Second, it undermines solidarity. As everyone is out to save their own neck, the uh, middle classes uh, are no longer care about the poor. Uh, the working classes are again, once again, uh, you know, afraid of immigrants who are supposedly there to take their jobs. Various minorities are competing for victimhood because this is the most sure path for some social protection. Um, and what I find especially worrying that precarity is politically debilitating. What I mean is that when it directs our efforts towards finding and securing a, a, a source of income, this leaves neither the time nor the energy for us to be engaged in larger battles for the type of life that we want to live. So surely, making us all more equal within a deeply unjust system is something to try to do. This is better than uh, spreading the injustice uh, un unevenly. But as we're at it, we might try to do better than that. You know, um, I think the type is right for a more radical and more meaningful change. And moreover, this change in our context can be done without a terrible crisis, without a bloody revolution, and without some glamorous utopia. And the book actually addresses some of the measures, some of the, it, it gives some ideas of how we can make this happen. Right, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the solutions and uh, we're gonna cast aside the glamorous utopias. Before we turn to Luca, I would just, so we're all clear and kind of on the same page here, you mentioned a kind of overworked lawyer, you mentioned uh, a rich but unhappy banker. Can you kind of give us some more tangible examples of where pre precarity comes up 
in okay. life, since in your opinion, it affects the 99%. Right. So where else might we see it in day-to-day -day life? What um, does it look like? Yeah, very, very good idea. Um, so in those students, I'm a professor at the university, those students who come to me for their uh, third and fourth master's degree because they cannot find a job. So um, even students from very elite institutions are worried that they cannot get a job. Even in the, you know, my son who studies physics is, is afraid that the only place he can find employment is the stock exchange. Uh, so- Which would lead to more precarity. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the, the young generation uh, is, is very much affected by that. Um, then people in, in permanently chasing, you know, applying for jobs. Um, it's, a, it's an illusion that there's employment for everybody if you have a good education. Okay, fantastic. Luca, um, so Albana has kind of painted a picture, uh, a narrative over the last two, three decades uh, leading up to the kind of culmination of a precarious moment. Could we uh, write the same narrative from the point of view of inequality? And if so, what would it look like? Thanks for the question and for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. So good evening, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll answer the question. Perhaps i just say a few words about, about my first reading of this book oh, and, and my uh, how, how I got introduced to it. So I, I hadn't read the book. And um, and um, basically, I, I got to, to read the, the, the title first and a, few, and a few reviews about the book. And I understood that potentially there would be a, a big clash between the book and what I uh, work on, what I analyze and the, my understanding of, of current day capitalism. And, and so, and I was, um, I was uh, gifted the, the, the book by, by Albena and thank you very much for, for that. It was a great read. So I really encourage you to, to read it. I think it's a very exciting book. And in fact, there were three moments for me in this reading of the book as compared to what, how, I, how I see capitalism and inequality. Quality. And the first moment was, okay, well, actually, I don't see where the clash is. I agree with, uh, with, 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 with what is there. So sorry, no, no clash tonight. Um, so, 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 okay, so what do we agree on? Basically, the fact that in politics, in economics, uh, over the past 40 years, we tend to forgot about um, really thinking about the economy and about power structures in the economy, which create this consent uh, in the population. And I think Albena makes it very clear that uh, center-right politics and center-left politics tended to forget about what really people deeply care about, what makes the good life, and to provide solutions for that. Basically, a policy in government, we're not doing this anymore over the past 40 years. Um, so deep agreement with that. Uh, another deep agreement with, you know, there's, a, there's an easy way and sometimes perhaps a lazy way to look at populist movements and to say, well, these are populists, we should not listen to them. And in fact, whatever they say is, should be disregarded. Also broad agreement with that. I think it's, it's a, populism is a lazy term and we need to, to go further in our understanding of what it is. Um, but now let me turn to the disagreements. Um, right, because you don't study precarity, you study no, inequality. Absolutely. So. And um, where, where, where the disagreement comes from is that I think a big part of the book is about trying to say that we should not care about inequality. We should care about precarity. And um, in fact, I think that we should basically care about both because extreme inequality creates precarity. And because if we look and if we study the return of inequality with my colleagues, Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Saez, and this vast group of scholars over the world with whom I work with, it's because the return of extreme inequality. So if we look societies now, they are much more unequal than they were 40 years back. And 40 years back, they were much more equal than they were 40 years before. So there is this you know, U, U curve of inequality. It was high 100 years back, it decreased after the world wars, and then it rose back again. Why do we study that? Well, because there's an association between more precarity and high inequality. Why? Because, you know, 
Warren Buffett, and I think this could be a line, a, a quote. There are also very nice quotes in the book at the beginning of each chapter. And I think this also makes the read pretty enjoyable. There, there's one quote I didn't read there, but I think it's, I wanted to share it with you. It's by Warren Buffett. You know Warren Buffett, so US billionaire, so owner of Berkshire Hathaway. And he says, so of course there's a class war. There is a class struggle and a class war, and it's my class, the billionaire class, that won the war. And he was saying this line while he was having an interview with the New York Times reporter, and he was looking at the amount of taxing that, taxes that he was paying as compared to the taxes paid by his secretaries and people with a little income working for him. He was looking at the inequality in tax rates. And he was saying, well, there's a problem here. And in fact, the system is rigged and the system will lead to even more concentration of power and wealth and wealth and power. So there's this vicious cycle between more economic inequality and more power inequality. And this translates into more precarity. Why? Because in order to attack precarity, to address it, well, you need basic access to education, basic access to health, good, good training. You also need minimum wages. And I think we definitely, we agree on that with Albena, but where I would like to, 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 to basically point out a different is where I think that this is partly due to the return of extreme inequality, which makes addressing these things more difficult because there, are, there is less funding for that for the reason that Warren Buffett was describing when he was comparing his tax rate with the tax rate of his secretaries. So you would say, yes, we should address precarity, but a prerequisite to addressing precarity is to address inequality. Inequality today means precarity tomorrow. Great. Another line, another quote. What would you say to that, okay, Alina? I will disagree with that. Probably because I grew up in a, a relatively equal society and the, you know, the communist regime in Bulgaria, that was very precarious. So um, mm. I would say, uh, yes, inequality, as we have experienced it in the West, leads to uh, terrible things like poor health, um, higher rates of imprisonment, um, poor mental health, etc but so did equality. So it seems to me that this is not the problem, that problem. So it, it, with a similar, a similar let me um, um, feel, be a little bit provocative, but could I then say that uh, under communism, the high rates of imprisonment and mistrust in society and poor mental health were a result of equality? Mm. Sure, that would be preposterous. It was a result of the political oppression. Mm. So we imagine, you know, make this uh, thought experiment, we can redistribute everything, let's say all the wealth, we can build perfectly equal societies, but they might be very precarious if we do not invest in, you know, healthcare, in education, so if we don't take care of the commons. And what troubles me in the discourse about equality is that it is only it is not a real negation of, of, of the brutal capitalistic logic of you know, neoliberal capitalism, because neoliberal capitalism focuses on individual responsibilities, on individual circumstances. And where we talk about inequalities, we compare individuals, we compare individual incomes, we can, in, uh, compare individual circumstances. And what we forget, we forget exactly that, that socialists have always uh, thought it's important, the commons. I mean, it, it, it's curious that even Marx did not believe in equality. The, 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 main, um, the main value of socialism is solidarity, not equality. If you remember the, the principle of justice he formulates uh, for communism, it is from each according to their capacity to each according to their need. This is not equality. Actually, Marx has written a very angry statement against um, Proudhon about equalization, wage equalization. Well, uh, he says uh, this can be um, achieved only through violence, and he was against violence. So what I'm appealing is to take also, well, I, I have many more arguments against our preoccupations with inequality. Um, if we say inequality is the problem, we have to be prepared to say how much 
inequality is acceptable, if at all. So on what grounds can we say up to here is fine inequality? And, and uh, so um, I, I'm puzzled by, by these kind of deficiencies in, in the analysis of inequality. Um, so ultimately I propose, I say, yeah, inequality can be a problem if it leads to social privilege, mm -hmm. but there are mechanisms that translate more wealth into social privilege. For instance, the, um, elect uh, the you know, electoral um, uh, sponsorship of, of, mm -hmm. of campaigns mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the US, that's a mechanism. So let's look at the mechanisms that translate wealth into social privilege. Yeah. Also, um, inequality becomes a social problem when it is the only, our only source of, of, of uh, security. Mm. And in our societies, this is effectively as the welfare state has depleted, you know, the commons, uh, less money invested in healthcare, you have to rely on your own wealth to take care of essential mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'm proposing is actually to take the concern with inequality as a symptom that something else is going on, mm -hmm. the symptom that of this precarization of everybody, mm -hmm. uh, the symptom that we have depleted the, the public, uh, the commons to such an extent that um, whether our societies are equal or unequal, this is not the point. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah. So you're arguing the inverse, which is to say that inequality is a symptom of, of precarity. So treat precarity right. first and then yeah. address inequality. But I would agree something with uh, my colleague here that we need to study the link between precarity and inequality. Maybe that is the next step in uh, social science to investigate this. Please. I fully agree. And in fact, I think there are already a lot, quite a bit of studies on that link. Um, for instance, the work of um, Emmanuel Saez and Raj Chetty in the US uh, show, um, you know, a very strong relationship between precisely your position in your in come in on in your income rank or more precisely the income rank of your parents and your probability of accessing higher education in the US. So basically if you're in the bottom 20% of the income ladder, if your parents are in the bottom 20%, you'll have 20% chances to go to college in the US. If you're a little higher, so but on 40%, you'll have 40%, at the top of the bottom 40%, you'll have 40% chances to get to college. Mm. If you are the very top of the, of the scale, you'll have close to 100% chances to access college. So there is a very strong correlation between exactly your position in the income scale and your chances to get access to good quality education. So I think this is a very strong argument in favor of looking at inequality and of understanding inequality as one of the things that is going to determine your life chances and to determine if you have access to these basic, basic things which create precarity. That's one thing. Another, I think it's um, um, colleagues from the UK, um, epidemiologists, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson, who look at how unequal societies are. And here I'm not you know, comparing um, Soviet or you know, communist, former communist societies, or you know, let's just look at European societies, Japan, the US, Australia, and you know, countries over $40,000 of income and that are market democracies, basically. And what they find is that the more unequal inequality there is in these societies, the more uh, diseases there are in this society, in particular, things like obesity, things like heart diseases, certain types of cancers, which are also associated to inequality through the channel of stress. And I think this is also related to what Albena was saying at the beginning, because there is this feeling of insecurity. But this feeling of insecurity is not just because you are below a certain absolute level, which would say that you're in precarity or not. No, it's, it's stress throughout the entire income scale, because if you're at the bottom, you fear that you will, you will fall below and you would like to be above. Mm -hmm. If you're at the, at the middle, you fear of going below, but you would also be, you know, like to be above. If you're at the very top, you will look down and you will see a lot of people that are trying to get up and this will, this will also create stress. So 
Inequality matters also for health uh, reasons. And final point, again, back to the Warren Buffett agreement, uh, argument. Inequality matters because in unequal societies, it's harder to collectively agree to finance what economists call public goods, mm -hmm. education and health. Why? Because the rich can provide for themselves for these goods. If I'm Warren Buffett, I can pay you know, education to my kids. I can have my private hospital. I can have my private airline. I can have my private library. So I don't need collective funding of these goods. And that is something that you see in very unequal societies. So again, the point is not to you know, level up all incomes. I, you know, I've barely seen you know, anybody say that uh, in, in, you know, in current contemporary debates about inequality. The point is to realize that current levels of inequalities in market you know, economies are much higher than they were 40 years back. And this means a very different form of capitalism. This means a very different way of doing politics and this means that it's much harder to lift people out of precarity. I think it's important to note, uh, Luca, that in your definition of inequality, it's, it's, it's broader than just economic inequality, right? You're talking about, you just mentioned health, um, education. You talk also about uh, gender, um, nationality. I mean, how vast is your kind of working definition of inequality? Um, and we'll go to Albana. Just, just one word on that. Yes. You know, when we study economic inequality, um, you know, we look at one indicator. But indeed, the conception of what the underlying problem is, is broader than that. Mm -hmm. But I think it is not right to say that this single indicator should not be looked at because, because it doesn't matter. No, I think it's very connected, economic inequality, to these various facets mm -hmm. of social inequality in general. Mm -hmm. And, and just as I asked Albina to kind of ground uh, her use of precarity in kind of tangible examples, I'm, I'm not going to ask you the same thing because I think we can kind of see it in our society, but I do have um, some statistics from your very recent World Inequality Report from this year. Uh, it was just published. If you haven't seen it online, I would recommend having a look at it. Um, it's urgent and, and shocking. Um, so here, here are some kind of statistics. So the richest 10% of the global population currently takes 52% of the global income, whereas the poorest half of the population earns 8.5% of it. On average, an individual from the top 10% of the global income distribution earns uh, 87, uh, 200,000 euros, so 122 hundred thousand US dollars per year, whereas an individual from the poorest half earns 2,800 euros or 3,920 dollars. Um, and then you also distinguish, so that's kind of on an individual basis, you also distinguish uh, this idea of kind of global wealth inequalities, which is to say the poorest half of the world and the richest half. Uh, you argue, uh, you show kind of statistically that these inequalities are even more pronounced. Again, we're thinking kind of economically here. The poorest half of the global population, you show, barely owns any wealth at all, possessing just 2% of total wealth. And by contrast, the richest 10%, which is to say us, of the global population, owns 76% of all wealth. Perhaps just one little point here that was global level right mm -hmm. um but in rich societies and i think this is also going to to connect to the book in rich societies there is a half of the population so if you look at france or if you look at the us that owns close to nothing that owns close to nothing so that doesn't have you know housing that ha that has you know perhaps three three to ten thousand euros as deposits but that's all and so if you look at the US or if you look at France or the UK, the bottom half of the population owns three, four or 5% of the total. And I think, so this is extremely important for our understanding of these dynamics here. And again, I think this is why inequalities matter. If the bottom 50% has so little, it's because the wealth is very unequally distributed. And so inequality, matters so i'd like i'd be very interested okay. to, to have yes. your point on that. um no a few things 
You know, the philosopher Harry Frankfurt in uh, his uh, book on inequality observes that the poor suffer because they don't eat, have enough, not because others have more and some obscenely much. Um, now, wealth, and I'm not an economist, so I'm surprised that I will have to make that point. Uh, it is like the you know, textbooks of introductory classes in economics. Wealth is not something to be distributed. First, it is something to be produced. So we live in a system that is set up to produce that wealth according to certain mechanism that, um, for instance, uh, gratifies effort, education, investment, risk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It produces wealth. It produces wealth that is unequally distributed. It is in the very logic of the system. Now, if we do not like the system, we have to also agree that we might damage the wealth production as we equalize that. Now, the issue from the point of view of the poor is to make sure that when they become relatively less poor, if we redistribute, they do not, do not become absolutely more poor as we deprive them of certain resources. So are we, are we talking about poverty? Are we talking about inequality? Because they're not directly correlated. And, and the devil is of course in the detail. We might have a context where because um, uh, the, 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 the rich have uh, too much, the, the poor, there is not enough for the poor, but that's not, I mean, that's basic economic uh, knowledge that they're not directly correlated. Now, these statistics that we, we heard, they're indisputable. Uh, indisputably, um, if you look at the, 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 these um, beautiful um, uh, tables, you will see uh, the Nordic countries and Japan on the one side, they're the most equal, um, people are healthy, less, uh, you know, so better health, better mental health, better physical health. Um, and then on the other side, you have uh, typically the US and, and Portugal. Um, but if you start looking at what's, you know, the picture in, in, in Japan, um, it is probably not because of, uh, of, of less inequality. If you look at uh, the, the, uh, the Japanese, they have a universal healthcare uh, insurance, universal uh, healthcare system. All residents of Japan, um, all residents, not just the nationals, by law are obliged to take uh, medical insurance. There is a lifetime employment in Japan. So these are the anti-precarity factors that explain to me uh, the, the, the good physical and mental health rather than uh, levels of inequality. Mm. Let's, let's just address your first point, which is to say, and, and maybe you can address this. I mean, yeah, you, I would like you to address it, which is um, why attack uh, the rich? Why, why focus on attacking the rich, the 1%, and why not focus on helping the 99%? I, th I think, you know, we should do both. Um, basically, you, you cannot, you know, the situation was pretty different 50 years back. But, you know, currently, you know, what amount of extra production can we make without, you know, completely burning planet Earth? So there might be limits to, you know, further production we can make, further wealth we can, you know, the wealth we, we knew how to create, we need to invent new forms of wealth creation in, in terms of you know, production, basic production. It's unclear how much more we can, we can so produce. So you're talking about restructuring our economic system. So if there's a limit to how much more we can produce, we cannot use economic growth as you know, uh, the tool through which we will provide more for the, for the working class, for the bottom of the distribution. Mm. So to some extent, there needs to be some redistribution, some mm -hmm. rethinking of how the cake is shared rather than how we're increasing the full size of the cake. That's partly how the two things are connected. But the other way these are connected is through political power relationships. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, actually, I'd, I'd like to come to, to, my, to the third moment of reading this book. I, I told you that I had three moments first agreement then disagreement and third that there was a, a basically broad agreement because mm. when, when i came to chapter seven last chapter recommendations Getting unstuck. what to do i was in agreement with everything basically everything 
So first, and first thing you say, we do need to tax the rich. And it's a good point to start. So, right. and so then I was a bit in a, you know, misunderstanding. Is it connected to what I was reading before? Because I, I thought that we should not yeah, talk but, about inequality and taxing the rich, I'll, but I'll, in the end, it's the first point that- But you know, let me tell you what I'll do when I tax the rich. <laughs> and then, yeah, what do we do with that? <laughs> do with that? We use it to solve the precarity problem. Right. So I also agree with that. Right. And then you also say that we need to uh, bring democracy within the firm. So that's to address power inequalities, you know, decision making inequalities. Also agree. And final thing, unemployment guarantee. Fully agree with that. So, and by the way, if we read a book like, you know, Thomas Piketty, his latest book, Capital and Ideology, you are going to see exactly these three big pillars of, you know, the new left, so to say taxation, but also, uh, you know, redistributing power within the firm. Mm -hmm. And third, some new basic guarantee system. So okay. broad agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where I was at the same time very happy and in a bit of a misunderstanding of why we need this, this, this segment of disagreement to reach to the same okay. conclusions. But, but before we uh, turn, to, I mean, I, I would just ask you, Luca, would you add anything to, since we are kind of turning to the more uh, solution-based uh, part of the conversation, what would you add to those three points from your perspective? I, I would add the environmental dimension in the sense that, you know, a burning, you know, burning planet Earth needs to be factored in our understanding of inequalities today. And so environmental degradation is the new horizon of social justice and social injustice. So climate change, if we don't do anything, is going to further, you know, exacerbate inequality levels and precarity levels. But why also inequality? Because I don't know who of you watched uh, Don't Look Up. I guess many of you. Well, some people you know, who are very wealthy actually don't care that much about solving the problem or not because they have this spaceship that can you know, go to in other planets. Mars, exactly. And in fact, this is already the case. Basically, if you go to Kansas desert in, uh, in the US, you can buy for about 100 million euros a uh, luxury loft that will protect you in the case of a collapse of civilization. In this loft, you have a private army, you have a private hospital, you have private pool, and you have fake L LED windows that project, you know, whatever you want to see outside. This is real. Have you been there? No, but I've seen it. Very interesting, uh, you know, and you can see they have a very nice website for those who are interested in that. So basically, <laughs> it, it is also... It, it, it is also a metaphor, but just to say that this, this, um, this film, I think, and the metaphor of the very rich, we're very close to there. To the minority not seeing the extent of the problem because it thinks that it will not be impacted as much as uh, a big part of the population. So again, I think inequality matters here. And the environment is what I would add, and you know, environmental policies to also address this inequality and of course, crisis. That's, that's what you work on. I mean, that's why. And you... I also do work on. Right. That. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. Um, Albana. Yeah. Um, so economic democracy, work involvement, tax the rich, uh, all this. Yes, these are um, the, the common points that the left makes. But I'm saying that this is not enough. And let me explain why this is not enough. You make workers, you, you nationalize companies even if you want. You make workers involved in decision-making, but you're, you operate in a context of a global uh, competition for, for um, profits. So we see China, it's a communist country that functions as a big capitalist. Uh, even if workers own their companies, they will behave in the global economy as capitalists in the pursuit of profit, of growth, of reinvestment, of self-exploitation, etc. So in our particular context, I, these, those old fixes that were the typical socialist agenda don't work because of global economic competition. Um, the environment, very dear topic to me. We are on the same page here. However, I want to observe something that we cannot both grow and redistribute in order to reduce inequality and save the environment. So the old formula of the welfare state of inclusive prosperity, it sounds great, but we are past that, that train is gone. Um, what we need to strive for if we want to both, you know, achieve the social justice agenda and the ecological justice agenda, 
we have to switch from grow, what I call your know, inclusive growth to solidarity in well-being. And part of the well-being is to, to, to give people stability rather than more affluence. Stop, stop promising affluence to people. You know, we are going to eat our existence away. So I think that we need to, to give people something. So replace affluence with stability. And you call this the political economy of trust. Yes. And broadly speaking, your political economy of trust breaks down into two main points you make in, in the chapter that Luca pointed out, chapter seven, getting unstuck, recasting globalization on the first hand and recasting uh, domestic policy on the second. Would you like to say a bit right. more? Right. Well, recasting globalization, actually, I must say this uh, already the, the Euro Com European Commission has been doing it. Well, great surprise, great delight. Uh, for instance, with the European Green Deal, uh, this is going actually against a lot of the um, disagreements, both from the workers and employers, uh, because they're worried about jobs, they're worried about this change. As I said, people are very conservative because they're scared. But, you know, the European Commission has been pushing against all odds, I would say, with the European Green Deal, and they are um, you know, doing things like uh, putting in law, trying to put in law, um, higher uh, labor and environmental standards for the products that are coming to the European market so that all the world can implement, you know, higher uh, labor and, and environmental standards. So this is really the way not to, you know, shut down our economies, um, you know, not to stop globalization, but change it, make it, you know, more uh, demanding in terms of labor and environmental standards. And domestic policy? So domestic policy there, and now I, I go against two fashionable ideas. One is job creation. Um, I agree there with the um, I, thinker, economist, um, anthropologist, uh, David Graeber. He wrote a beautiful book about bullshit jobs. Uh, we don't need any more bullshit jobs. We uh, least, what are what are some examples of bullshit jobs? Well, administrative jobs are uh, uh, mostly about innovation. We've been innovated out of. We cannot cope with uh, innovation anymore. But people are paid to innovate, so we are bombarded with more and more, and uh, every day something new. Uh, so bullshit jobs um, are not the solution because our societies. I'm talking about Western. Uh, capitalist democracies um, have reached a point where, thanks to science, uh, automation, we can um, produce our well-being, our uh, and necessary wealth with very little input of labor, so we can all work less. So the other thing, uh, uh, idea I reject is universal basic income impact. Uh, at some point I thought it's a good idea, Piketty, for instance, Thomas Piketty has proposed that each of us, uh, when we hit age 25, we get 120,000 euro. Well, I'd rather um, put that money into a robust uh, uh, education, housing, healthcare, build up the commons because the pot is not limitless. You know, you have to make a choice. Um, so, so the solution I would rather embrace uh, is voluntary employment flexibility. So don't push people into bullshit jobs, but allow people to work less. And that can be achieved with specific policies. Yes. Um, I'm looking at the time and I'm aware that there might be questions in the room or on Zoom. Um, before we turn to questions, I'd like to just ask both of you uh, a kind of broad question about how you think um, your work in academia kind of intersects with the real world, as it were. I mean, it's not as if academia isn't the real world, but the kind of uh, everyday life, let's say. And I'm, I'm departing from uh, the award that Albania's book won called uh, the American Political Science Association's uh, award in 2021, the Michael Harrington Book Award, which recognizes, and I'm quoting, an outstanding book that demonstrates how scholarship can be used in the struggle for a better world. Luca, let's start with you. Um, how do you think scholarship can be used in the struggle for a better world? What is the relationship of scholarship and academia to um, bunkers in America, for example? Well, you know, I think that 
deep down the the project of university, which is cosmopolitanism and 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 knowledge for a better world. Uh, so, which is about you know learning from disagreements, learning from debates, and standing on the shoulders of giants to you know see further. Uh, this is what scholars are trying to do, and this is what scholars have been scholars have been doing for hundreds and thousands of years. And I think that you know. It, broader in society, we also need to have this kind of uh, approach to problems. So we look at problems and we try to learn from diverging, competing opinions and uh, competing views of these problems uh, based on method. So method, different competing opinions, and then learning from disagreements and reaching always to you know, a better understanding of the situation. And that's what Scholars University provides. And that's what we need more in our societies where we tend to compete on our views about everything. And so we need to recreate some common understanding, common views. And I think that you know, the scientific method in social sciences is, a, is very well placed to do that. One problem is that uh, for decades, researchers have been just working in their ivory towers, a lot of them. And here I'm thinking largely about economists who have developed very complex models of the world. And then they were just, they were not talking to society, they were just talking to policymakers saying that are very, very complex models that you can understand because you're not clever enough are just fit for the world as it is. In fact, they were not fit for the world at all. And if you open up the black box, you understand that there is some treachery here. Um, and I think that what we're trying to do, so what Abena is trying to do, what we're trying to do from a different discipline is really open up scholarship research, open up the black box so that everybody can make up their own mind about what actually this is about. So when we produce these inequality statistics, when we have you know, some analysis on proposals, we really try to publish everything online. And we really try to you know, write also books like you know, uh, that everybody can read so that everybody can really under try to understand what this is about. And this is a different way to see research as compared to what has been done for many decades, at least in economics. Again, was there, there was this very technocratic approach to, to social science. So I think the role today is really to open up and to continue this open up, and it can help solve many of the fragmentation problems in, in societies today. Okay, I mean, I, I'm gonna to get to you. I, I want to respond to the first part um, of your answer, Luca, because it seems to me that uh, certainly a critique, um, I went to university in America, so it was more kind of rampant there, um, but the university campus is no longer a place of conflicting ideas. In fact, it's a place uh, of left wing, um, students who are not coming up against um, any other ideas apart from the ones that they espouse, um, what would you say to that critique, that the university uh, campus is no longer a place of conflicting and converging ideas, at least in America? I think it's, um, you know, a very well executed strategy of the far right um, to discredit and destabilize, uh, you know, university and and academic research. And what I'm afraid about is that this is now coming in France. And now you have you know, a lot of people who say, look at Sciences Po, for instance, it's just about you know, wokeism. Look at this university, they're you know, full of uh, Islamo leftists. And I think this, this is really what happened in the US debate where you had the far right well-organized you know, with, with a clear strategy to try to discredit the scientific method, basically, in social sciences. But I think if you really look at what's happening, you see a lot of diversity in research and you know, diversity in the type of thinking. Within the left, you also see a lot of right-wing research and or right-wing inspired research, and that's good. Okay, fantastic. Um, Alina, yeah. to you, and then we will have questions. Okay. Um, I don't think the issue is about the clash of perspectives, because if we have two, um, you know, sclerotic versions of the left and the right clashing, there is not much interest in that. What's important is actually academia avoids 
like the cliches, avoids the doctrines, avoids the ideology, and there is a fresh thinking that comes from observations of people's struggles with everyday life. Mm -hmm. So I would rather appeal for academia to be less ideological, whether left or right or, yeah. Um, and the great, I'm a political theorist, the greatest ideas in political theory have always been born not in the you know classrooms but out of response to specific grievances specific problems mm -hmm. and this is the kind of science we need to keep producing okay thank you so much can we have a round of applause please for both Alvena and Lika thank you so we have about 10 minutes for questions are there any questions in the room start yes Okay. I heard that this uh, all this this discussion today. It's more based on the Western world. How about China? Does it work over there? It's a totally different system. It's the biggest population in the world, and it's the future. And uh, how does it work? Your model. Well, the I confine my investigations to what I know. And this is Western capitalist democracies. So I have re indeed nothing to say about China. I could share some views, but that is not what I do in the book. No, I, I think it's it's um, it's an essential part of uh, also the method that we try to apply um, to our uh, look at social sciences and at inequalities, these international comparisons. And so um, we've been doing quite some research on China and also on India. And I think it's important to interesting to compare these two countries uh, and also to inform the debate we're having today about precarity. Um, in China, um, since the mid 2000s onwards, there has been a stabilization of their inequality levels. And between 1978 and the mid 2000s, you actually see a country that opens up, that deregulates, that privatizes a big parts of its economy, and that sees a big rise of inequality. But since the mid 2000s, actually, what the government was doing is investing a lot in infrastructures in rural areas, roads, schools, and health centers. Um, and so the consequence of that is limited inequality levels. In India, this, and so there, I agree with what Albino was saying, that sometimes inequality can be a consequence of precarity or less inequality can be a consequence of less precarity. And that's what we observe in China since the mid 2000s. In India, it's really not the same thing. Basically, the Indian governments did not invest in these basic things, roads, you know, public schools in rural areas. And so in India, over the same period of time as China, so India also, also deregulates a lot and, and privatizes a lot since the mid 1980s. And you see a continued rise of inequality to the extent that it might now be very difficult for the Indian society to basically do these investments because you have these situations of power lockages, you know, high economic inequality, high political inequality, and then, you know, it's a vicious cycle. So I think it's, it's very interesting, you know, how in China basically, but I think it's also related to, at some point, the fear of the government that too much inequality might destabilize the system. Can I just uh, add something? Um, it's important to understand that a precarity is about disempowerment. So the opposite of precarity is not economic stability. Uh, the, the, the root of, uh, you know, the etymology of the uh, word comes from a preca the Latin precarious, which means something obtained uh, through prayer or charity. So when we are at the mercy of a, of a dictatorship's will, mm, we are precarious. So maybe China is fighting inequality, it is stabilizing the commons, that's great. But if you live in a political dictatorship, you're precarious. And f I mean, indeed, fully agree on that. So let me precise. I was mentioning here economic precarity. Yeah. And of course, the political system in which you live is going to constrain in China the absence of basic rights, voting rights, freedom, just to say what you want, to think what you want. Great. Any other questions in the room? We have quite a few on Zoom, but I would like to 
reward people for coming out in person. <laughs> no? Okay. So, yes. Yeah, you mentioned that you uh, wrote about what you know about, which are these advanced Western wealthier industrialized societies. Um, I actually think it's would be very interesting to hear more from you about your understanding of precarity and the former Soviet uh, system. Uh, I know you're from Bulgaria. And uh, to me, the issue of precarity versus economic precarity and the political implications of that are extremely important. And I don't think you talked enough about it in the book. And as an old Soviet hack myself, I really would have appreciated better understanding uh, some of that. And I know you have something to say about it. Maybe it's the next book. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I've been actually avoiding writing about Eastern Europe, I'm too close to it. Uh, but it's time for that book to come out. Uh, yes, so precarity under the old regime, uh, and I call it the old regime because they call themselves uh, communists, but they were hardly communists. Yeah, they just appropriated the label, unfortunately. Um, so under the dictatorship, um, there were there was so much social privilege, although there was economic equality relatively, but it was the social stratification was rather extreme. So I would say, and, and then to be at the will, at the whim of, of the Central Committee of the party, that was extreme political uh, precarity. So in principle, you have to think about the economic, um, the social and the political factors of precarity. And I would say there, economically, yes, we were, um, we, we, we had a good um, um, education, healthcare system, fair healthcare system. So these things were in place, but there were other drivers of precarity. Yeah. Great. I just want to get to one question on Zoom. We've had quite a few questions uh, about the relationship between capitalism and democracy. Uh, we've talked about politics over the course of the evening. This is a question from Christopher Vuha, uh, although it highlights other questions that have been posed. They ask, uh, I'll pose this to both of you, how does capitalism need to change in order for democracies to more fully function as actual democracies, be it in the US uh, or other alleged democracies around the world? Luca, let's start with you. How does capitalism needs to change? Yes. Well, you know, that's a big question for one minute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, answer. 30 seconds, please. <laughs> Well, you know, I think that if we start um, again with the three pillars at the end of the book, um, you know, let's just get our taxation system straight. And I think that in the in the web of difficult things to do uh, in front of us, this is a difficult thing, but it's perhaps not the, the most difficult thing to do. And we should start with that. Then let's democratize, you know, power in within firms. And then the question is how much, to what extent, and this raises many important questions. I would like us to discuss more about that in the current French election campaigns than you know, identity politics. And this is also where I fully agree with Albina that you know, the debate is focusing on scapegoating the foreigners because we're not talking about the real problems. And third, I would also say that, yeah, pillar three, um, you know, employment guarantee. And if we're, if we're doing that, I think we'll solve you know, a big bunch of the problems that our our societies are facing and that are also our political systems are going through Lena, okay um, final word yeah i i would uh, suggest that we diminish as much as possible um the considerations of the profit motive in important decisions about society i'll give one specific example in 2017 the european commission uh proposed um, that we develop vaccines against uh, viruses like the coronavirus. That was within an entity called Innovative Medicine Initiative, uh, uh, which is a private public venture between the European Commission and Big Pharma. And Big Pharma said, no thanks, because we cannot make profit. And then the European Commission didn't follow up. This is an example of when the profit motive should not play into a consideration by a, a public uh, authority taking uh, Im uh, important decisions. So we need to, to eliminate uh, these kind of uh, mechanisms. Um, second, I teach a class about capitalism and democracy. Take my class. <laughs>